All right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming back. Uh, we're going to have a very informative and educational uh, presentation here on building a blockchain startup. And I'm going to be giving it. Um, it kind of comes from my background having run three startups uh, as a founder and CEO and as a developer. You know, I started off as a programmer probably about 25, 30 years ago. Um, used to be a Java programmer and wrote a book on the Java programming language. And then I, I became a founder after that. And I learned a lot of hard lessons as a founder and made a lot of mistakes as a founder. Um, so I was kind of an engineer who learned business over time. And uh, given that there's a lot of engineers in the audience that may be aspiring uh, founders, I thought maybe I can help you in both, you know, kind of tips for, for a growing company, but also fundraising and things like that. So I'm gonna share my screen here with you now. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them in, in the chat here. And we'll take it from there. Give me one second to share my screen. Okay. Hopefully, you can all see my screen here. And go ahead and start the slideshow. Uh, by the way, last time we had a little crash happen when, when I presented. Hopefully, that won't happen this time. If it happens again, then I'll just, I'll just reload and be right back. So, hopefully, everyone can see this okay. So, these are tips on building a blockchain startup. And this is going to be a very interesting presentation because there's no text on any of these slides. I decided that instead of doing text, there's going to be a single image on each slide, and that'll be accompanied by my explanation. And the reason why I'm doing a single image is because it's kind of a mnemonic device to remember things. If there's a vibrant and large image that's evocative, then um, your mind tends to remember it better, and it's better for retention. Um, I, used to, I used to run a company that would teach programmers how to program, so this is a commonly used technique for retaining information. So I hope you enjoy it. So this is a picture of a woman playing a guitar, an electric guitar violently with um, sparks flying out of, out, of, out of the violin, et cetera, right? And she's very passionate about playing the violin. And you could see that in her, her mouth movements and with the sparks coming out of the violin. And so this picture is here to remind us that you should always be working on your passion um, if you're gonna be, be a founder of a startup. So your passion effectively um, is, is the problem that you're trying to solve in the world. And we normally encourage founders to fall in love with the problem in, in the world, not necessarily to fall in love with the solution to that problem. Um, you, can, you can create many different solutions to solve a problem. And your first solution may not be the correct solution. Sometimes it requires iteration to find the right solution. But by falling in love with the problem, that's what creates your mission in life and your mission in your startup. And so this, this can also be applicable, by the way, if you are uh, an engineer working on uh, working on a product, for example, maybe you're not starting a company, but you're trying to solve a problem with that product, you can also apply this best practice there too. So a lot of folks ask me, how do I, how do I find my passion in life? How do I find what, I, what I'm actually going to uh, fall in love working on? And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people struggle in this area to find that passion. Um, there's been, there was an excellent blog post I read about probably about 10 years ago on this. The blog, blog post no longer exists, but the, the takeaway point from the blog post is that you actually choose your passion in life rather than you finding your passion. So um, if you can find a problem in the world that you are kind of passionate about, um, by working on that problem and by investing time into it and by, um, by putting all of your energy into it, um, over time you'll actually generate emotion, uh, you know, kind of in, in your brain you will generate um, positive signals um, that that actually make it so that you fall more and more and more in love with that problem the more time you spend on it. Um, and that it's just a natural human reaction to mastering anything. So as, as you spend time on something, you master it, you develop your skills, that gives you more confidence, and you start to fall in love even more. So that's why you see a lot of folks in the world are kind of obsessed over certain problems. They didn't start off that way. Nobody was born in a certain way to solve a certain problem in the world. They, they actually just chose that. So if you're looking to find your passion in life, you may want to just start with something small, something that you're kind of passionate about, and then grow it from there. This next image is keep calm and stay single. So this is this is basically tips for finding a co-founder if you're going to work on a project together. So um, a lot of folks I find rush into this idea of like let's let's find uh, let's find a team to work together very quickly, and uh, more often times than not, these like shotgun winnings don't really work out, and there's oftentimes a split between the co-founders. So um, 
what I've noticed has been a, a, a good pattern is to create value yourself before necessarily seeking out a partner to build it with you. And, and the more value that you can create initially for yourself, the better. Because if you're able to create some value, let's say your initial minimum viable product, for example, um, you can then use that as ammunition to attract a, a great co-founder to work with you. And you'll have a better conversion rate on those co-founders and you'll have more leverage in those, those conversations and those negotiations. So, so this is just kind of a, a caution to try to create value before you ask for anything effectively. Um, this is a, a man who's walking up with back pain. Um, uh, this reminds you about solving a deep pain in the world. So we talked earlier about problems that you could be solving. Um, the most valuable problems to be solving are ones that are that are expensive and deep and valuable. So um, too oft, more often than not, startups are created to solve a shallow pain, a pain that is uh, kind of a nice to solve problem, like a vitamin rather than a painkiller. And what, what we found is that um, just over the last 10 years of investing and, and running startups is that um, if you're able to solve a deep and expensive and valuable problem, the solution to that problem tends to be valuable, basically. Um, and so there's a correlation between those two. So if you're starting off with, with a, a must-solve problem, then you're probably on the right track. Um, this is a picture of a Ford Focus, and this reminds you to focus in life. So uh, building, building a company is no joke. It is, it is a roller coaster. It is hard. It requires a lot of effort and energy. Um, and oftentimes you're going to be distracted by other things. Um, this is one of the reasons, by the way, why it's very difficult to start a company while you're working at another company. Um, and it's one of the biggest challenges um, with building a company. So if you if you decide that you want to build something, I'd encourage you to put all of your energy into it. Um, it's uh, it's something that, you know, like one of the things that, that you can get into trouble with in life is to kind of be a, a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And, uh, and that, that's very tempting to do if you're starting a company because you have all of your existing, um, existing relationships in life pulling you away from building your startup. So focus is key. And this is also true for raising capital, by the way, for a startup. It, you know, if, if you decide that you want to raise a round of funding for your company, uh, focusing just on fundraising is actually the right decision. And, and focusing only on that and nothing else at your company is what's going to actually help you succeed in raising that fundraising round. So focus is applicable in a lot of a lot of different ways. This is a picture of, of a boxer with a coach. And uh, this is kind of like one of the best practices that I really strongly believe in is to surround yourself with people smarter than you are who can give you great advice. Um, oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll be looking to hire those senior people for your first company, but those people may not be available to, to be hired right away because maybe they're too senior to work with you. So one of the tricks that I've used in the past is to is to hire them almost like, like an advisor and, and as a coach to help you on a part-time basis because they're basically unhirable right now because they're so senior and they've got much better options than joining a risky new startup. So, um, so, this, so one way you can engage with these folks is to bring them on as advisors. And then if you create enough value and if, you're, if your company becomes valuable down the road, then you can actually graduate those advisors up to become full-time employees. So it's almost like the advisory role is uh, is a baby step towards them uh, becoming your your fu your full time coworker basically, and so it's it's a natural progression towards that. Uh, this this is a reminder to build a mailing list. So having a community for a startup is is so important in my experience. Um, okay, and there's lots of communities that you could be building here. One community you could build is a mailing list of investors. So as you meet investors and as you start to get them excited about your vision, you can put them on a mailing list and you can you can keep them informed about your progress. That way, in case you want to raise money, uh, you can tap into that mailing list down the road. You can also use this as, as, as a list uh, for a potential new users of your product. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with, with kind of building a landing page and, and promoting a vision for what you're going to build before you actually code it. A lot of programmers, they dive too, qu too quickly into actually writing code, and, and they haven't yet fully confirmed their hypothesis yet. So by, by publishing, um, you know, your vision for what problem you're solving and a solution for that and by building a list of interested users who may want to use that um you're getting you're getting that feedback up front from those users and then you have this 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 large mailing list you can tap into when it's time to finally launch your company um this is an example this is a quote from theodore roosevelt about history and the more you know about the past the better prepared you are for the future so the, the key here is, is to basically do, do research when you're going to build a new project about what were the prior attempts that were similar to, to the solution that you're, you're trying to build, basically. And what I found is a lot of founders, and especially engineers, 
um, don't necessarily take this 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 effort. And uh, um, you know, at least in my experience, you know, a lot of the the ideas out in the world or the problems that are trying to be solved <clears throat> that are obvious have already been attempted by other founders in the past. And uh, and oftentimes you may be uh, repeating uh, some some of the the past efforts to solve those problems. So you know, spending a lot of time on Google and doing searches up front may save you a lot a lot of uh, basically re reduced waste uh, down the road effectively. Um, this is a picture of a plane taking off on a runway, and it's basically to, to effectively to remind you to make sure you have enough runway, effectively personal runway, to build a startup. So, you know, normally it's going to take you uh, a number of months, maybe even years, to get traction for your company, and so you know you need to make sure that you're timing things so that when you leave your your prior organization, that you have enough uh, enough personal time and capital to get there. And I wouldn't necessarily rely on investors up front. Uh, investors like to invest when there's a little bit more proof points for a company. So oftentimes you'll need a little bit more runway than you think to, to get your company off the ground. And then when, when, here's Yoda, you know, the, the famous quote from Yoda, do or do not, there, there is no try. This is just a reminder that, you know, if, if you are going to build a company, you have to kind of go all in and, and you have to be willing to say no to things, um, especially opportunities that come your way. So one of, the, one of the things that I've learned in life is that your success in life is sometimes directly proportional to the things that you say no to, say no to in life and the things that you turn down. Um, sometimes those are, are difficult conversations, you know, where you have to um, disappoint people because um, they're making things urgent and important for you in your life. But if you're going to build a company, that is your urgent and important project. And that, that does take precedence over some of the other things that others may make urgent for you. So, you know, just remember Yoda here and try to say no to things and just do the project, but do not, don't just like kind of half-ass it effectively is, is the lesson learned here. Um, here's a picture of, of a slightly overweight man on a beach and he's living a great lifestyle. Um, you know, he's, he's enjoying it, he's surfing, he's with his family, right? A lot of investors and founders make fun of, of what, what they call lifestyle businesses. These are businesses that are, or projects that are small in nature. Um, you know, for example, um, building a little application that may not make a lot of money or building a small protocol that doesn't, you know, that isn't large in scope and, and excitement. Um, and a lot of folks poo-poo on these kinds of lifestyle kinds of projects. I personally disagree with that. I think that um, you can, you know, you can be very successful as a founder um, building something that is small and you can build on top of that over time. So don't worry about how exciting and large your vision is and this and that. A lot of investors will give you that feedback. Um, just focus on, on what you're passionate about and you'll naturally grow from there. Um, this is just kind of a reminder to, um, to that if, if you're gonna be building a company, um, you know, this is a man exercising and building weights. It's all about repetition effectively and not all the tasks for building a company um, are gonna be fun tasks. Sometimes they're gonna be repetitive tasks. Sometimes they're gonna be tedious tasks that involve operational work or things that you might not like to do. You know, you might be a programmer that enjoys programming, but this might, you know, you might need to do um, kind of a lot of people person tasks or operational tasks that may not be as fun for you. And so doing that kind of grunt work and repeating that grunt work is, is directly correlated to your success as, as a company. It's, it's, it's not always going to be fun to build a company, but the, the rewards come down the road and, and the journey is a lot more fun if you kind of fully embrace it and are willing to do the repetitive work. Uh, here's a picture of of a uh, of, of an ice skater, and it's kind of it's kind of a, a famous quote by um, by Wayne Gretzky, which is that uh, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take in life. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take in life. So, kind of lesson learned here is that you kind of need to take your shot, and even if other folks are saying that what you're building is garbage and I don't believe in it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if you have conviction and if you have passion then you need to take your shot in life and you shouldn't let other people talk you out of it unless you agree with them. So, um, you know, take your shot. Um, if you don't take your shot, if you don't start a company, then you'll never have a chance to make a successful company. So just taking that shot in the first place has a lot of merit. Even if you fail, you will definitely miss that shot if you don't take it in the first place. So I, that's why I encourage a lot of founders to start companies when they're young, um, when they don't have a lot of kind of things tying them down in life, because they can take, take a lot more shots more quickly. Um, and it becomes actually harder as you get older. So even though you get more wisdom and knowledge as, as you progress in life, you also have more things weighing you down. So taking those shots early and often are probably 
um, what I'd recommend to founders. And uh, and this this is a man kind of in a stretcher, and he's kind of um, you know he's, he's kind of badly bruised. And so this just reminds you that when when you're building a company, it's going to stretch you to your limits, and you uh, you're going to be tested beyond what you thought you would. Uh, the the hours are crazy, and um, uh, you know you're going to have to put a lot of per your personal life on the side, um, and that's okay. You know that is normal for building a company, and so you should be, just be mentally prepared for that if you build a company. And this is this is actually a, a scene from Indiana Jones. This is Mum Ra with a heart. And just the reminder here is to put your heart into your startup and to put everything into it. And that's that's going to be the, the key to your success. So, so I hope that was helpful for you as aspiring founders. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Hopefully, it will not crash me. If it does, I'll be right back. Oh, great. It didn't crash. Perfect. Um, and that was it for my presentation. So I hope that was helpful to everyone. Um, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, let's go ahead and go into some of those questions. So. Um, can nonprofit projects or companies be proven grounds for for-profit ventures? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, we think of nonprofits as just as viable uh, potential MVP and MVP projects for building a company. Actually, um, uh, the fact that that a nonprofit may not have a direct revenue model or may not retain earnings is not correlated to actually that project potentially succeeding. And in fact, if you look at most blockchain projects. Um, they are actually nonprofits as well. They have a nonprofit foundation. So that's that's a great example of a nonprofit um, that that uh, that that um, th you know that can be used to, as an an analogy to answer your question. So um, so great. So um, and then one last question: ideas for where to meet potential co-founders. So I, I don't recommend working with your friends as co-founders because it, it could damage the relationship with your friend, and it may not be a way to know if you're uh like you may be a little bit biased working with your friend they might not be the right candidate to work with you long term we we think that the best way to meet a co-founder is actually to work with former business business colleagues of yours so in past roles where you may have worked as an engineer um you you have experience working with someone in the field you know you work well together you've been productive together that's the best litmus test for whether you'll work out as co-founders so i think we're just about out of time here so we're going to transition to our next session so thank you for listening to me and taking these tips. Um, by the way, the, the reason we gave this presentation is because unfortunately, uh, the co-founder of Edge and Node did have computer issues today. So I developed this backup talk just in case uh, a speaker would no show. So unfortunately, the you know, Edge and Node, which is the graph, will not be presenting today. Um, but we're grateful for them to, to have tried. And now we're going to transition into a talk from Eigenlayer, which is going to be uh, a fantastic talk on, on the future of restaking in Web3. So, um, really appreciate you guys listening to me today, and we're going to be right back with Eigenlayer.